Thank you all so much for joining the first episode of the Resource Remix, the new podcast from the Natural Resource Governance Institute. We bring listeners dynamic perspectives on the cutting edge issues affecting countries rich in commodities from cobalt to natural gas to lithium. The need to transition to a post oil future and the pandemic present these countries with a range of unique challenges and opportunities. Please join us for future episodes in this series as we talk with some of the most innovative thinkers and practitioners seeking to shine a light on ways forward in this most critical and fascinating time. I'm Sneeta Keimel. I've been with NRGI for more than a decade and now have the honor of serving as its president and CEO. I may be a veteran of NRGI, but this is the first time I'm hosting a podcast, so please go easy on me. Our guest today is Joe Asenka, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing now for eight years. We met when Joe was part of the Global Development and Population Program at the Hewlett Foundation, which is one of NRGI's founding funders. He recently returned to his native Ghana, where he is now CEO of Afrobarometer. Joe, welcome and thank you so much for joining me in this first episode. Thank you, Sunita, and really thank you for having me on your first episode. I'm really grateful and on it. It's a pleasure to have you. So let's just start with a question for the listeners who may not be that familiar with your organization. Can you tell us a little bit about Afrobarometer and what its mission is? Right. Thanks. Thanks for the question. And thanks to your listeners for the opportunity to share with you what Afrobarometer is and what we do. First of all, Afrobarometer is an Africa network of research organizations that conducts public opinion and public attitude surveys across the continent. And as the name implies a barometer, we're trying to measure something, measuring people's attitudes, opinions about issues of governance, the economy, quality of life, and civic engagement, among other things. And we currently work in about 30 plus countries. And for each round of the surveys, we started in 1999. And so we've been two decades into it now, and we have done eight rounds of the surveys. So each survey takes about two years to complete. And so we are in, we just completed the eighth round in 34 countries and we have just started to launch the ninth round of the surveys. It is in the ninth round that we want to be able to get up to 40 countries and hoping that that coverage would give us more leverage in terms of engaging more with African leaders, especially at the regional level in bringing people's voices to inform policy making. And if I may just add that the the core mission for the Afrobarometer is that we we believe that people's voices matter when it comes to policy making, because decisions about policy and development is all about the people. And we think we need to put people at the center of all those decisions to ensure that their priorities, their preferences, and what they experience daily in their lives is reflected in what leaders do in policies. Thanks, Joe. I couldn't agree more. And I think in many ways, coming off of the spike of the pandemic and dealing with so many economic, political, and and social upheavals around the continent and around the world, being able to hear that voice of the people is more important now than ever before. I'm curious, uh, given how many surveys you do uh, conduct, if you could talk a little bit about what you think one of the most interesting survey findings is of late and why. One that I would highlight is the growing demand for a deeper form of um, democratic governance. And I say so because when we ask our respondents since, I mean, the last decade, to just tell us whether they to choose between two options in terms of governance, whether they want an effective government that may not be accountable or they want an accountable government, even if it is not that effective. And most of our respondents go for the latter, that they want an accountable government, even if that government is not very effective. And this is kind of surprising because generally people would think that in Africa, everybody cares about the economy and their lives, livelihoods, and not about governance. But what we've seen starting from a decade ago, when we had only about 50% of the population saying they prefer 
a, an accountable government to an effective one that is not accountable. That has grown over time and now it's almost like 70% of the population really wanting accountable governance. And I think that's kind of debunked a lot of you know, myths about Africa and what Africans want, because what we have documented is that they want a deeper and meaningful form of governance than just delivering economic benefits. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Joe. It's so interesting. And obviously, we know from many resource rich developing countries that corruption is actually one of the major obstacles, not only to that accountable governance, but also, of course, ultimately to sustainable development. So I'm curious if you can um, talk a little bit about some of the recent Afrobarometer surveys in which we know Africans have shared that corruption problems are actually getting worse and that in many instances, governments simply aren't doing enough to address them. So could you describe for us what key trends in citizen perception we're seeing around corruption and how should that inform the strategies, the interventions, the work that organizations like the Natural Resource Governance Institute, but also our partners across Africa um, should be focused on? You know, measuring corruption has always focused on you know, the elite level, you know, expert opinion in terms of what the practices are like in each country. But from our surveys, we get to experience and hear what ordinary, you know, day to day, in the day to day lives of people and how they experience different types of corruption. And our documentation has shown this steady views about the levels of corruption and especially in the recent, maybe in the past five years and after COVID had hit, that perception and the views that corruption is a major problem is, has actually increased over time. And so in many ways, that there are many things that influence this. First, starting with national elections. There are lots of people who get this sense that elections and the way they are run are not clean enough and that there's a lot of dirty money that go into politics. Now, both making politics very expensive, which then means that people who get into government find out, find ways to recoup some of their expenses in order to pay off their debts. And then, of course, they start amassing some of that wealth towards the next election. And so what happens because of the increasing cost of elections, people get this feeling that corruption is likely to become rampant because politicians will have to pay their debts once they are in office. And so that's one trigger that we see consistently people reporting higher levels of corruption among setting uh, public offices. The second piece is when it comes to issues of procurement, you know, there are lots of scandals around procurement that easily leak into the public domain. And as long as people hear about how procurement processes have been used to siphon public resources for private gain, it just fuels that you know, perception. And we've seen lots of those stories being the basis for what people think is happening in their community or within, within their countries. And you can't begrudge them because if these scandals continue to be the case, of course, it gives a signal that this is what is happening. There's some levels of corruption in, in the public sector. And the final thing I just want to note here is usually certain expenditures that governments embark on are not well explained to the public. And once people hear those extravagant expenses, so for example, and the country wants to buy a presidential jet to the tune of $100 million. And there's no explanation to the public as to why and what is, what is the, the rationale for it. And that can provoke that kind of view that public officials just want to use public monies for benefits that are not necessarily in the interest of the public. And that fuels this there's views that you know, corruption is rampant on the continent. And as I said, in the past 10 years, we have seen it tick up and up and up and people feeling that corruption is rampant in their countries. 
Thanks so much, Joe. I wanted to pick up on a couple of points that you made. Um, first of all, around the gap between having these great policies on the books and great frameworks, but then not actually seeing that implemented in practice. And as you are aware, in the 2017 Resource Governance Index, we found this trend um, looking in countries around the world mm -hmm. of a growing gap between great policies on paper and poor practices. And we actually, in our new 2021 Resource Governance Index, are seeing the persistence of that trend. And so I think this is an issue that collectively we really need to address. I think by contrast, we are seeing good progress on contract transparency, increasingly on transparency of suppliers as well, which um, speaks to hopefully a positive trend or a tipping point around that. But as you said, one of the most important things is making sure that there is that active civil society that can participate when information is becoming available and to push that public debate, that public dialogue, and it's civil society, it's citizens, it's the media as well. And we know that one of the challenges to democratic accountability is the closing of civic space and media coming under increased pressure in many countries around the world, but also many countries um, in Africa. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about any insights you're getting from your surveys on citizen engagement and the ability to actually hold government um, to account. All right, so that also comes back to you know leadership responsiveness to citizen engagement, and I think the closing of civic space, which seemed to have been you know on on the rise even in the pre-pandemic period, it does seem like we've gotten to a point where the pandemic may have created even more problems for us because what we had tried to salvage initially may have been undermined by you know, the onset of COVID-19, which just creates some more opportunities for governments to shut down dissenting views and, and the like. And what, what we are generally learning, of course, we try to document the different ways that <clears throat> ordinary people engage with their leaders, both at the local level and nationally or even globally. And over time, what we've learned, you know, some of the areas we've documented are people's participation in community meetings, getting together with other people to raise a particular issue that is of concern to them, contacting their leaders, whether it is local, national, or national leaders. And then, yes, the act of engaging with leaders and in ways that they think can bring an outcome of interest to them. And what we have, of course, obviously, when it comes to contacting leaders, local leaders tend to be the most contacted. And so whether it is religious leaders or traditional leaders at the community level, they, they are the ones that people mostly go to. When it comes to elected leaders, the contact is a little less. And perhaps for the good reason that maybe elected leaders are not always in the communities and so they don't get to contact them. But nonetheless, of course, elected leaders are supposed to be responsive and be listening to their constituents in some ways. What we have learned from our service is that citizens do not think that their elected leaders actually make time to listen to them. And this is a concern we've documented over, over and over again, that elected leaders, except during elections, never make time to listen to ordinary people like themselves. And so when it comes to whether or not people feel like they can make a difference when they actively engage in a process, it's only a few people who think so, not, like, not more than 30% of our respondents. But we realize that people who feel like their engagement can make a difference are the ones who actually actively do the engagement. So it's like the self-efficacy. They believe that my actions will lead to a good outcome or an outcome that I'm looking for, or at least influence the outcome in some way. It's a big driver of whether, of whether or not people actually engage, whether with their elected leaders or in town hall conversations or even local leaders. And so, what when I'm trying to figure out, and especially you know, when thinking about how to 
reactivate in our civic engagement. One of the benefits we've seen in the COVID period is that one, everybody has realized that now in government with the lockdowns and media censorship in the name of the COVID-19 has reawakened people because the last survey we did in between 2019 and 2021 and the June 2021, what we documented was that even though people, Africans were committed and willing to accept the lockdowns and comply with them because of the health reasons, a large majority are now concerned that they think governments may use it to increase their power. And that is a big fear on the part of people that civic space is likely to get worse after the pandemic, because some of the measures that were put in place as temporary may be beneficial to certain actors in power, and they may not be willing to let go of those um, uh, actions, uh, interventions that they put in place. And this is a fear that a lot of people on that we've spoken to have expressed. But we also see a positive value out of this, that because people are aware of the risk that the COVID-19 might pose to civic space, it is possible that people will be more willing now to wake up and fight against the tendency to close a civic space. And so for civil society organizations working in this space, I think mobilizing people, especially when it comes to social movements against civic space, uh, civic space closure might be much easier now given the awareness of people and the fear that they express to us that they think that governments might use this to increase their power. Um, and I'm curious, you know, Joe, we've seen so much um, political upheaval, frankly, around the world in the pandemic, but also within Africa, political and mm -hmm. social changes over the past few years, even just recently, um, tremendous upheaval in Guinea. There's been crackdowns on media in Nigeria. Oh. There's been governments overturned in Tunisia, new leadership in Tanzania and Zambia and elections that are also accompanied by internet shutdowns in Uganda and the Congo. What you said earlier about the elections and corruption is so interesting and it, it brought to mind Indonesia where there's a very similar problem where mm -hmm. you, know, you pay for votes. And so it leads to breeds this kind of clientelism that right. is incredibly undermining to democratic accountability. So I'm, I'm just curious as you reflect on these trends, reflect on political upheaval across the continent. Do you see common threads that unite these political moments? And as you look into your kind of crystal ball for the future, do you see trends or opportunities to shift politics uh, across the region? Um, I'm just curious for your, your future perspective. Hmm? Right, so yeah, thank, thanks for this. I, I think in many ways, many of the shifts that we have experienced in the, in the recent past, I like to call them you know, the highs and the lows on the continent in terms of um, the changes. Of course, these are very different types of changes across the continent and there may, ne there may not be a common thread across all of them, but they are setting underlying, you know, issues that one can identify. Of course, when you talk of the highs in terms of you know, what really happened and sounds very positive, talking of Malawi and the Supreme Court's intervention in that fraudulent election that ended up having the opposition come into power was like a really positive sign for everybody. And you know, the government coming into power under those conditions does give people the motivation, the, the, the signal that positive things can happen when institutions actually work the way they're supposed to. The same thing, of course, Zambia with credible elections that delivered the victory to the opposition, which by and large, young people played a big role in that process, which one would say the younger generation, given that Africa is a very youthful population, if the younger generation really means to do something, they can change the way politics is done on the continent. And so those two are like really positive signals. And that, of course, power alternation is possible even in places where we have not seen power alternation in, in a long while. And so when 
when you look at some of the changes, even though there are no common threats, we know that there are positive changes that are worth emulating and continuing to build on. So that if the Supreme Court in Malawi is able to do this, it means the institution of the judiciary can work well if we, 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 mean, to, we mean to actually um, strengthen them to do their work well. The same thing in Zambia, we know that you know, the young, young, the younger generation can really make a difference when they mobilize and want to have to effect a change. Thanks, Joe. And I think what's interesting and in what you're saying is that there are these different trends or moments that are challenges from a political perspective, but also opening spaces and, and opportunities. And one of the things that um, we have seen in terms of the possible manifestations of social unrest is that in the context of you know, the pandemic and also in the context of the energy transition, natural resources, which already had significant expectations around them for benefiting the public good, are now um, seeing even less benefit. And so there's this significant risk that that will drive greater social unrest. Um, and the energy transition is obviously something that is on a lot of people's minds. Well, also there are concerns that say, you know what, we have to focus on the here and now, we need to focus on meeting the needs of our citizens and our populations. And in some African countries, the energy transition is seen as this kind of agenda that's imposed from afar. And so I'm curious, Joe, if you can talk a little bit about the perspectives that you are hearing from citizens, also from governments on the energy transition and how to consider the prioritization amongst the, the many challenges um, that uh, people are facing on the African continent. Right, so for the energy transition, even though we haven't asked specific questions to our respondents in terms of what their perspectives are, it suffice it to say, I mean, two things. One, that the reality is going to hit everybody. And how far or how long it is going to take to hit everybody is what the concern would be. For several of, of course, natural resource rich countries, I think the, the challenge is the short term nature of the way governance uh, governing actually works on the continent. And if for countries like Ghana, where elections are held regularly, then that long term thinking in terms of what will become of fossil fuels in the next 10, 20, or 30 years feels too distant a future for politicians who are in power now or who will come to power in the next four years. And so to stop and then think about what that means, it just probably not on the radar. They may think about it, but taking it into account in terms of strategy, strategizing for what happens in the next 50 years to ensure that countries are still on track and can continue to finance their development is probably not the case. And I, this is why I see the work of NRGI and other actors in this space to be so crucial because we don't see the danger that is looming, that if fossil fuels become you know, less profitable, and that is going to be the case because over time and giving one, of course, commodity prices keep fluctuating and governments feel it. They know that when prices drop, this is what happens to their budgets. But then if, if the prices were to drop even much lower than what they are now and they remain consistently so for the next 10 years, how are you going to survive? And I think this is where I just hope that institutions like yourselves with the expertise to do this kind of modeling and the scenarios that may emerge as you know, resource, the value of resources, and especially fossil fuels begin to decline because they are going to decline regardless. No, it's, not, it's not somebody's choice, but that you know, climate change, the climate change agenda for sure and other issues that we want to address to ensure that the climate or at least our world remain habitable for, for us in the for, for years to come. The change is necessarily going to come. And what is how does the scenario look like for different countries? I think that will be a super useful way of really awakening governments, even if they are thinking short term, 
to know that even in even in that short term, it can have disastrous consequences if you continue to rely on them. And so, as I said, if I don't think that governments are not aware of this. I'm sure they have experts in there who know and are aware of this. It comes down then to how to activate them to be more conscious about taking practical steps towards planning for the transition. And I know that your institution and others have been thinking about this transition and how do you then bring that into governments and making sure that these scenarios play out in their heads and their faces in a way that enables them to take concrete steps and actions to address them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thanks Joe. And I think this is, as you said, why we are feeling this urgency around resource governance, because on the one hand, we know that there will be a decline in fossil fuels, how slow, how fast, those are the questions who goes first and making sure that that's fair and equitable is such an important conversation. But on the other hand, there is this tremendous opportunity as well with uh, the minerals that are critical to the energy transition and making sure that um, countries balance both how to seize the opportunities around critical minerals, how to manage the risks around um, the fossil fuel decline just puts natural resource governance really at the center of the conversation and, and even more critical than before. One question that I wanted to um, pick up on from some of your former work, um, Joe, is that there have been many organizations within the development space, within the transparency, participation, accountability space, really critical to that model of democratic, accountable governance that you spoke of, but haven't necessarily seen an end to systemic racism, to exclusion, to injustice, to inequality. And I think many of us in the development field, in the transparency, participation, accountability fields are querying what we need to do differently to be able to really shift power, to be able to shift agendas. And so I'm curious what advice you would give for global organizations like NRGI who are seeking to advance this agenda of decolonizing development and how should we be doing our work differently to be effective, but also to be really addressing um, this persistence of inequity um, and exclusion. Right, and so um, let me start by saying that I've always firmly believed in partnerships. And I think the, the issues we all work on, whether it is governance or people's livelihood or the economy and the health of the economy, they are all interconnected. We live in such an interconnected world that any issue or any action we take or the intervention we implement has implications at all levels of government. And so this is where the partnerships and interconnectedness come in, because when you talk of shifting power, my view of it is more about creating partnerships that are of equal footing and taking advantage of each person's or each partner's comparative advantage. And I think this is, <clears throat> okay, that's one level of it. So thinking about, you know, power shifting and not just saying that I have power and this is yours, I give it to you, take it and that's your power now. That is not the case because institutions, global institutions like yours and local institutions that operate on the African continent like ours, we have different strengths. What the strengths that institutions like yours bring into the frame may not necessarily be existent in some of the institutions, local partners on the continent who know the context well work on. And so this is where I see the complementarities coming in, that in thinking about ways that we can advance our collective agendas, whether it is a global agenda such as, you know, um, illicit financial flows and trying to stop the leakage of public resources into different locations. That is a global effort that requires everybody's hands on deck. If it comes to local issues, like whether it is budget or procurement issues, of course, that combination of expertise from external sources and local expertise working together and taking advantage of each other's comparative advantage to advance the agenda is super critical. And so 
I would say, um, you know, shifting power in that sense that it is not that somebody is giving power to one, but that the partnerships are on equal footing. The second component of it is just openness and transparency about that partnership and the relationships that exist. And always it comes down to resources, the budgets that we're going to use to run a particular program, how open are we about the whole envelope and what goes into what. And I think anytime you have a partnership where there is no common understanding of the resource envelope, then the power dynamics begin to play in. How do you take away that power dynamic and making sure that everybody is, is that there's visibility in the resource envelope that allows you to then work with each other in a way that is clearly on equal footing and everybody understands what is it that what are the amount, what is that the resource envelope, so envelope we're working on and what are we hoping to achieve and with what we have, are we able to deliver on the outcomes that we hope for? And I think if we do those two things well, I see that to be the clear basis for shifting power that our operations are transparent. We are open about our resource envelope with everybody and that we operate on an equal footing and we just take advantage of each party's you know, comparative advantage. And once that is done, I don't think there's any further way to shift power than you know, partnering in that way. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. I have to say, as you know, NRGI does work in partnership on many different levels, but I think it's so important to do that listening, that learning, that acting in the spirit of that partnership. And I think that's something we can all, all do better. Um, I wanted to just ask a couple of last questions. Um, obviously the world has been in so much upheaval and mm -hmm. all of us are trying to figure out what the right path and course are for our organizations in this moment. And so Joe, as you have just recently taken up the helm at Afrobarometer, I'm curious, first of all, what is it that keeps you up at night? What are you really worried about? Um, not with the organization, but as you think about um, the world writ large, and what are you excited about? What are you seeing on the horizon that maybe gives you that spark of, of hope to, um, to persevere? Overall, I think my biggest concern in terms of just general development on, on the continent is the, the sense of general frustration that we have documented from our findings that the extent to which people really want in a democratic and accountable governance and the supply of it, the gap is just too big and is beginning to widen that people are looking for this this um, real form, form of democracy that will deliver accountability, deliver responsiveness to citizens. And yet the supply side, people are completely not satisfied with the way democracy works. And we have seen that just ticked down from 1999 to date, it has just been a downward trajectory. And unfortunately the last round, it just went even further down in terms of people's satisfaction with democracy. And so there's this anxiety in me that if people are increasingly being frustrated and several of our respondents also tell us they feel that their country is going in the wrong direction. And so when you have, especially in Africa, a very youthful population that is getting increasingly frustrated with the way democracy works and they feel that their countries are not really heading in the right direction. Are we just sitting on a time bomb? and could something might, might something just explode. And I think that's a big risk. And that is something in terms of development that I'm really concerned about. How do we bridge the gap between the demand and the supply of democratic governance? But then, of course, that then takes me to what keeps me excited. I, I know that the work that we do in this space do have, does have an impact because anytime we go to speak to people, whether they're in a very remote location or in a gated community, we get the same sense of people really eager to engage and talk about their frustrations and their feelings. It used to be the case that people would say doing public opinion in Africa may not work because people are busy with their lives and they may not have time to talk. But I can assure your listeners that whenever you sit down with somebody to talk about these issues, this is when you really see people you know, open up and speak. 
And the other sense, there's always the sense that people may not tell you the right thing, but that we have found to be very false because when people, even if they think you are from the government, because often our surveys, we would end the survey by asking, who do you think sent us? And sometimes people will say, we think it's a government that sent you, partly because of the types of questions we ask, even though we'll tell people upfront that we are from a civil society. But then it is even at that point that people are really ready to vent their frustrations. And so the questions, they are really ready to engage and they will try to give you reasons why they say what they say in, in response to your questions. And so I think it does give us this, I get excited by the fact that we're able to gather all this evidence and put it together and then bring it to the steps of policymakers, present it to them in ways that they can incorporate in their, in their work. And we believe, of course, we make the data available publicly. And then we know that lots of institutions use this data in ways that is beneficial for policymaking, even if they don't acknowledge the data in any way. And we don't, that is not the, the purpose for gathering the data. We want the data to be used to influence policy. And so I get excited about the, the fact that I'm able to, I'm working in an institution that is able to, to deliver on that front. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you for taking the time today to join me for this first episode of Energy Eyes new podcast. And I think one of the big takeaways is the importance of continuing the conversation um, at all levels. And I just want to thank you for sharing your perspective, your experience, your expertise, and also for the good work of the Afrobarometer. Thank you so much. And thank you to you and the NRGI team. I have appreciated your work all along and I really value what you do. I know you have a big role to play going forward, especially with the energy transition and climate change. These are mm -hmm. critical issues that it takes several actors to address. And I'm glad that you are here and I do look forward to engaging with you further.